I have uh, several bits of research that I want to share with you, as well as some observations about how New Jersey uh, need not make its own mistakes in principal evaluation, because you have such a rich source of mistakes being made elsewhere. That you um, there is a one-page handout that's being circulated right now, so please make sure that you have that. If anybody, if anybody would like to have uh, the slides that I'm going to put up, I'll post them on the web. You're more than welcome to share, their, share those with your membership, share those with your colleagues, and, and for that matter, other stakeholders too, because the case that I'm going to make today is that what we're about with regard to leadership assessment is inseparable from getting teacher assessment right and from getting, even more broadly, accountability for education. They are all a piece of the whole. And this association, I think, can not only take the lead in linking learning and teaching and leadership evaluation and creating a model for educational accountability that is significantly better than the myopic focus we have had for the last 10 years on reading and math grades 3 through 8. The result of which has been, if it's not tested, it's not important. And every leader in this room knows there's a lot of things that are important that have been rendered as a result invisible. And so the overall pattern for what I want to say is to essentially say to policymakers and to the president, the secretary, with everyone else, with great respect, uh, we'll see you on it and raise your head. We're willing to be accountable for the things that are on the table. In fact, we're willing to be accountable for the other 80% of the things that we're doing that have been rendered invisible. And that's what I want to try to uh, get across this morning. But first, for those of you who know me know that you cannot escape a session with Doug Reeves without some research. So we're always going to start with some 2012 research, then I'll get to the other issues on the agenda. <clears throat> Let's talk about what's wrong with administrator evaluation. In about 30 states that we looked at, 18% of administrators had never been evaluated. Um, the evaluations were largely politicized and ambiguous. Actually, let, let's leave the light up so people can see their, their paper. That these guys have been in the um, A lot of the evaluations were ambiguous. They were political. And think of it. They were actually evaluations that if you were evaluating a first-year teacher who gave feedback that was ambiguous, that was unconstructive, that wasn't used to improve achievement, you wouldn't renew that first-year teacher's contract. And yet we tolerate that level of evaluation for administrators frequently. Moreover, I don't think this is just a principal issue. I think you want to take the lead in talking about central office leadership, superintendent leadership, because what we found is that the longer the tenure and the higher the rank, the more ambiguous and political the assessment became. So you know who do, we do a really good job of assessing is a brand new administrative intern. Because it's okay to tell them you need improvement, to give them feedback, it's okay to talk in constructive terms, but the 25-year veteran, the assistant superintendent, the superintendent put together that. The longer the tenure, the higher the rank, the worse the evaluations were. And it's led to a problem that now, with the new March 2012 study, we have record levels of principal transients. This is what I would call the neutron bomb school of theory reform. You leave the building standing and kill all the people inside. Now, let's, let's just challenge that. We're losing, we're losing more than 20% of our principals within the first two years. Transiency is highest where we most need stability. And the theory behind the neutron bomb effect is, you know, if you got a problem, let's, let's hold somebody responsible, put their head in the platter, and move them out, and then student achievement will improve, right? Wrong. When the principal leaves after a year, student achievement declines in subsequent years. That's March 2012 evidence, not prejudice, just evidence. Moreover, the quality of leadership initiatives is strongly associated with principal stability. In a study of more than 2,000 schools that I did, we found that the real key wasn't what program you bought, it wasn't the brand name, it was depth of implementation. And a focus on fewer things implemented deeply is what was most strongly associated with improved student achievement. But if that's our goal, you eviscerate focus every time you have a policy that leads to more and more principal turnover. So let us ask the big question hanging over policy today, can we fire our way to Finland? Well, because everybody wants to be like Finland, you know that, I know that, there's this little industry and traveling over there, I'm sure there's splendid people, but let's just ask the question. Because it's not only a problem at the principal level, it's a problem at the teacher level. And the case I'm about to make with these data, brand new again, December 2011, is that when we simply create policies that make it easy to fire people, but we don't think of the cultural context of that, we will continue to fail. This is an experiment that comes to us courtesy of Chicago Public Schools, where for 12 years, for 12, I'm sorry, for three years, for three years, they had the opportunity 
to not only non-renew first-year teachers, this was anybody not in the tenure track. So they had people with up to 12 years of service. That included people elementary, middle, and high school in every academic area, and they had the much vaunted value-added data. So the theory goes, right, as long as I've got the value-added data, all I do is fire the bad ones, keep the good ones, and then a miracle happens. Let's test the hypothesis. In three years in Chicago public schools, one-third of principals, now remember, all you had to do was click, non-renew, renew, no lawyers, no hearings, no documentation, just click, it's your discretion. One-third of principals never used the authority when they had it. If all we do is change policy, but we don't also think about the culture of support for teachers and administrators, nothing's going to happen. Now, it's not as bad as that, of course. Uh, what, what did you have to do to get fired in this three-year system? Well, if you missed 30 or 40 days without excuse, that would get you fired. At the elementary level, there was a minuscule statistical relationship between low value added and getting fired. At the secondary level, a zero relationship. Why? Because there, we talk about what we value in terms of student achievement, but it's not what happened. And this happens at the teacher level. I'm going to argue in a minute. It's likely to happen at the principal level if we don't confront some major changes. About 0.13% of those folks in Chicago who were actually fired had ever been rated unsatisfactory. The other 99.8% have been called satisfactory, 94% called excellent or superior. Friends, this is a formula for enriching the lawyers of New Jersey. And many of them are nice people. I got a ride from a lawyer this morning, so I'm not saying anything bad about lawyers. I'm just saying this. <clears throat> if you want to spend more money in the next 10 years on litigation than on education, set up a system where somebody's got 20 years of water walking evaluations and then tell them they're unsatisfactory. I want, to, I want to say that we've got to be able to have a more honest and differentiated system that is going to separate feedback from learning, assessment from learning, and evaluation that has personnel consequences. So here's what I think we can put together. Teaching and leadership and learning all at once. So I'm going to suggest we need to ask some essential questions about why we're doing this. I mean, if the purpose, if the purpose of administrator evaluation is how can we rate, rank, sort, and humiliate our educational staff members in both administration and teachers? Look no farther than to your neighbors who think putting scores in the newspaper here in the West Coast is a good idea. If, by contrast, we want to have accountability as a learning system, we can ask these two questions. Number one, which specific teaching strategies yield the best results? Notice I'm capitalizing, capitalizing our students, our schools. I'm not talking about what you do elsewhere. I try to do some research. That's nothing but a rearview mirror. I'm talking about how can we ask in a relationship, in direct observation, what specific teaching strategies work for our kids in our schools and which specific leadership strategies yield the best results for our teachers in our schools. That means, as a result, if you make it this analytical learning approach, we may all start with the same framework, but we're not going to all emphasize the same dimensions of teaching and leadership because we recognize that there are a diversity of needs for students represented in this room, for teachers, depending upon the staff, and for the leaders. Common framework, yes, but not a one-size-fits-all approach. It is from the rearview mirror, what happened in other places, other schools, to the windshield, what's happening right now in real time. And I'm going to suggest that some of that, however it may intuitively be obvious, is not being used elsewhere. When we use the rear view mirror, let's just accumulate all the research. And look, I'm, I'm part of the researchers' union too. I've, I've done very large scale quantitative studies. I've tried to contribute. So are a lot of other people. The problem is this. When you read, today it's Reeves, tomorrow it's Hattie, the next day it's Marzano, the next day fill in the blank, then what do you have? You've got the law of initiative fatigue with one thing piled on top of another, on top of another. Ask your friends who were winners quote unquote, in race to the top states. Some simultaneously have 75 or more instructional initiatives at the district level. It leads to fragmentation. And the evidence that I've gathered with more and more schools says that when we get to more than about six initiatives, the best principal in the world loses his or her ability to focus on deep implementation. Not a shred of evidence says that fragmentation leads to better student achievement. In fact, what it leads to is frustration, anxiety, stress, and burnout. You've seen the recent 
things that the teachers are facing and, and that you are too. You can work an 18 hour a day, and some of you are, because I see the email stamps, time stamps on your emails. You can work an 18 hour a day and still not get it all done. Because this whole approach to do it all, if I can find something in research that says this works, quote unquote, then we're based upon this kind of change model. A little bit of incremental change gets you a little bit of impact. Here is what that would look like graphically, because I used to believe this too, and I was just flat dead wrong. Got a problem, let's, let's start a new program. Implement it a little bit more, you'll get better student results. A little bit more, you get better student results. Implement it more, you get better student results. I wish the evidence said that. But now we're over 6,000 schools in a separate research study trying to identify the relationship between implementation and gains in student achievement. Here's what it looks like. You got a problem? Nothing happens. How about some more administrative mandates in your next Rodolfo training? Nothing happens. How about some more initiatives? Nothing happens. And right at that point is where change goes to die. Because at this point, after trying things again and again and again, typically layered on top of other things, people say, well, shoot, that didn't work. Let's go get something else. And so we're back to the left-hand side. And we get to the red line again. Well, that didn't work either. Let's get something else. Now, the good news is, at the deepest level of implementation, there is no question about what you can demonstrate and impact on student results. This state, for example, has a lot of professional learning communities. And some of those professional learning communities are at this far right end where you can ask them for evidence that they are not only looking at data, but evidence that they have used the data to make better decisions, evidence that they have used the data that influences student results, even evidence that students are using data. That's the far right. And at the far left, there are schools having spent the same amount of money, doing the same amount of training, and have changed the name of the faculty meeting to professional learning community. Or they are looking at data as if we are looking at animals in the zoo. Observe the data in its natural habitat, but, but never evidence that we're using the data. And we're spent, and, and that's not because of malice. That is because they've got about 11 other things going on in the same meeting. And that is not an exaggeration. I have looked at the agendas of some so-called professional learning communities, and everything in the kitchen sink has been poured onto them. There's not malice by teachers or administrators for this fragmentation. It is that we've got an archaeological dig worth of one initiative on top of another, on top of another, and people never have a chance to get to the right hand, uh, right hand line. Here. So, how does this influence principal evaluation? It seems to me that we can have some very specific. Um, very specific results. I want you to envision, if we were to agree that there's, oh, I don't know, seven or eight, depending on who's you read, 10, 12, 14, different leadership strategies, it would be obvious, if I just leave them like that, that they would have differential impact on student achievement. Nobody who reads the literature would say everything we do is equally important. In fact, we've got a, a sense that some things we do is more important than others. And leaving it labeled like that, wouldn't it make sense that some of those things on the far right, what we're calling strategy six and seven, would make a lot more sense to, to overemphasize in a leadership evaluation. And some of those things on the far left that have less of an impact, we would pay less attention to. In the abstract, it makes sense. But let me, at the risk of being a little bit inflammatory here, having only a return Amtrak ticket on the regional, uh, <laughs> replace these with what I think the evidence says. I have read, friends, more than 2,000 school plans. I have analyzed every component of them in the theory for every one of those planning requirements that you spend hours and hours and hours doing is that if you do that element of the plan better, you'll have better student achievement. Sometimes it's true, many times it is not. And there's an extraordinary amount of principal plan time <coughs> spent in planning that is not, therefore, allowed to be spent in instruction and leadership. Planning is never a substitute for that, and yet a huge amount of compliance is all based on the documents that you file. Look, I mean, no disrespect to the New Jersey Department of Education, everybody's got plans, everybody does Title I. This is a national phenomenon, and they were all born of good intent. The problem is, I don't see people testing the hypothesis. If you do this, then achievement gets better. And at some point, if we were to start testing that hypothesis, as I think you might consider doing, it would be a very worthwhile project, because uh, we've done it elsewhere, and what it reveals is that you can eliminate a lot of things that people are doing 
that do not yield gains the student achievement. Contrast low impact of planning to the very high impact of feedback. The most recent research on this is John Hattie's splendid, brand new 2012 book, Visible Learning for Teachers. Of all the things that you could spend time doing, providing feedback to colleagues. And note well, I'm not saying evaluation. I'm distinguishing between feedback. Here's an observation. Here's the only notes. Here's some ways the class can be better. Here's some ways the class is great. Nothing going in triplicate. Nothing going into the database. Just an observation. I think more than half of those observations that we do could be like that. Not necessarily going into a database. Ditto for leadership conversations. If we want to have a candid conversation with you as a respected professional, I need to be able to leave the HR stuff at the door and just provide feedback for learning. Because in that context, I can say the two words that we all know are true, and that's needs approval. It's part of the human condition. But if everything is, is under the realm of evaluation, and you use the word needs improvement, you just started a grievance. So let's distinguish feedback from evaluation. And I know that there's other things, I don't need to analyze each one of those, that have an impact, but just let me take a look at that next to last one. Of the 150 things that Hattie analyzed in this new 2012 study, the number one impact on student achievement was explicit goal setting by students and by teachers. If we could walk away here with just two ideas of improving leadership impact, it wouldn't be better plans and better compliance. It would be better feedback and more specific and clear goal setting. And if we're serious about saying what we really want leadership to do is have an impact on achievement for the state, then we've got to choose wisely how we allocate our time. So, I want to say that, that you're, because this is an organization that has displayed courage of its convictions, you have a potential to set a national model here. And I want to just be bold enough to suggest some, some ways that you can do this. I was moved by your organization's core belief, policy, and practice. What I want to do, in as respectful and challenging a way as I can, is to challenge us to align those core beliefs, policies, and practice. Because this is a defining moment. You're not going to be able to say, we hold these beliefs and then enact policies that are directly contrary to them. For example, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I want to start with, number one, teaching and learning is our top priority. If we believe that, then we have to reject what's happening around the country, where in the nine states that Ken Leithwood studied, more than 60% of school leader time was spent not in instructional leadership, but in administration in response to compliance. No malice, I'm just saying, your calendar says what your values are. Next, New Jersey challenge. We believe in shared leadership and accountability. Then why is it that we maintain the myth of unitary evaluations? Wouldn't an honest thing, when I lay out in, in my system, I have 10 elements of, of leadership, and nobody is ever great in all of them. By design, the leader with integrity doesn't go say, I'm the perfect person on the white horse riding in to save the day says nobody can do this. But I'll tell you what I can do. I can build a leadership team that includes administrative leaders and teacher leaders, and as a leadership team, we can have a team that will lead this building successfully and bring to the table sustainable capacity so it doesn't depend upon just one person who goes in and out the door. If we really believe that what your value says, shared leadership and accountability, how is that going to be reflected in accountability policies? We say that we believe in trust, mutual respect, and ethical behavior. Now, does that mean that we are willing to value what isn't evaluated? For example, right now there are, I, I, I don't side with those that say accountability drives us into cheating. I think that's an astonishingly uh, small group, and, and besides the preposterous notion from the report filed this week that any, any quote, statistically improbable increase in test scores means that you were cheating it would of course mean that it's impossible to improve. If you don't improve, you're a failure. If you do improve, you're cheating. That, that's crazy. I'm, I'm talking about a deeper ethical issue. And that is when you're being willing to be public, publicly held accountable for things that other people don't notice. For example, we say we value 21st century skills like collaboration. Um, what do you call it? Kids collaborate with state tests. Oh yeah, so, so we'll have to figure out some other way, we'll have to figure out some other way to value and assess collaboration. 
We say we value communication. Not one state in the United States evaluates public speaking. None evaluate using communication for uh, using technology for communication. Fewer states today evaluate writing than did 10 years ago. So if we say we evaluate, we do it whether or not it's part of the evaluation. The same can go on with so many other things, service, leadership, music, the arts. The ethical issue before us is, are we willing to do things even when they don't count? Challenge number four, collaboration, innovation, risk taking. Those words are right out of the association's document. If that's true, then I've got to be able to take the risk to try something that doesn't work. I've got to be able to go to you as my boss and say, I tried these three intervention strategies last year. Two of them worked. One of them didn't. Here's how I'm going to fix it. And if the answer is, thank you for your integrity. Thank you for reporting it publicly. Thank you for making accountability a learning system. Then you're following this association's value. But if you shoot the messenger and say, oh, failure, that's the end of bonus territory for you, then, then don't expect anybody to accurately report experimentation on which leadership in teaching success depends. Any science gets better, not through certainty, but through error. And, and open acknowledgement of error, you've got to make it safe to do that. Indeed, one of the things that I write on my dimensions is a leader must have specific ideas of, of when he or she has made errors and demonstrated publicly how he or she was resilient bouncing back. But I don't see that very often. So, we're going to differentiate, as I said, assessment for learning and evaluation. I want to encourage you to leave room in your deliberations for things that are not part of the formal evaluation system, that are simply feedback. The evidence says, by the way, remember, for kids too, things that aren't graded, things that don't count, but have good, effective, specific feedback could be a very powerful impact on student performance. The same is true for us. We need to make sure that it's timely and constructive. I, I want to respectfully push back on the notion that one observation or two observations done formally is anywhere near enough. What we need are, are many, many conversations that are specifically focused not on some telephone book rubric, we're going to say, but on a few things that with your discretion and judgment, you know the teachers need or that the people supervising the administrator knows that that administrator needs. It's not the telephone book. It is a laser-like focus that is differentiated one school to the next, one classroom to the next. The feedback needs to include a blueprint. That is why I insist upon rubrics. The ones that I recommend have four levels. So if you're going to give me a three, give me a blueprint for how to get to a four. Don't just call me a three. That's what's wrong with a lot of evaluations now. And while I'm there, let's make sure that we talk about the incentives for clear collaboration and support. Because the response to feedback if we do it right, is not a grievance. The response to feedback is improved performance. But that'll only happen if we get the details right. So I've been kind of global. Now I want to get down into the weeds with you. Because these are things that certainly I hope are not going to be legislative issues, but they are details that as working administrators we've got to be able to cope with. Number one, do not use the average. If you're going to have multiple observations, then you can't average the last one into the first one, so you're punishing people in June for the sins of January. The whole idea is, did we respond to feedback? And if we responded to feedback, it's the last evaluation that counts. Everything else is in pencil, not in pen. Number two, abolish the norm. I know that we have people of goodwill who disagree on this, and who believe that we ought to just have the top 20% uh, get extra money, and the top 10% get even more. And you know, everybody's entitled to their own beliefs. God bless the First Amendment. They're just not entitled to their own facts. Read Roland Pryor's analysis on financial incentives in New York, where you had two groups of schools, and administrators and teachers and one were incentivized. All other variables the same. Same union contracts, same for people funding, same demographic circumstances. Others didn't have the incentives. They got the incentives. The impact on achievement? Zero. Similar study in Texas, zero. Similar study by Robert Sutton in California, zero. Now look, give people extra money if you want. Just call it what it is, paying them for their job. Let's stop this illusion that the top 10% is going to get us better. In fact, it's worse. Because once, once you make this a zero-sum game, you lose only when I win, I win only when you lose. You have just crushed any incentive 
to make the entire system in New Jersey better. Indeed, I would turn this upside down and say level three leadership on a four-scale system. Level three is doing a great job in your school. Level four is showing evidence that you've helped the college. If we really want to design accountability as a learning system, something that helps the entire state, then create incentives for collegiality, incentives for collaboration, incentives for sharing best practice, not incentives for concealing it. I'm going to skip these things on performance continuums as I've written about that elsewhere, and I want to make more time for dealing with what an innovative accountability system looks like, and then having some time for questions as long as my host will allow it, and then we've got a panel following. So let's, let's make this in the largest context. I talked about how learning and teaching leadership fit together so far. Now I want to think about how we can take this work that you're doing and put it in the context of an entire accountability system, how, how we report to the public, not just what we do as individuals, but what our entire school, our entire system, our entire state is doing. So first of all, we have to ask ourselves, what is the purpose of accountability? Not recall to rate, rank, sort, and humiliate. The purpose is to make it a learning system. So based on the feedback that we get from my colleagues and from myself, I'm able to perform better. A next generation accountability system <coughs> will be experimental, which means we check our academic certainties at the door. All the rear view mirror tells me is what worked elsewhere, in other states and other schools. If I'm going to move the windshield, I'm going to be trying some things and they won't always work because this state is too diverse and too complex to have a one-size-fits-all approach. That means error tolerance. Indeed, we value errors because that is the only way we learn to focus more. That's why when you talk about things like the nuts and bolts of plans, I'm not being critical of whoever decided that agenda item number 17 in a school improvement plan had to be there. I'm simply saying, if there isn't evidence that doing it at an exemplary level leads to better achievement, stop doing that. This is the Groucho Marx School of Improvement. Doctor, doctor, it hurts when I do this. So what do you say? Stop doing it. Okay, let's do it. Um, focus, not fragmented. Uh, I despair that everything in the kitchen sink is getting thrown at these things. I was just at NAESP in Seattle last week, and with very good intent, uh, they have a task force that identified 68 responsibilities of the principal. Will you give me a break? And that's not even as much as they're expecting you to do with some teacher evaluations right now. And it will have the opposite, the opposite of what we expect. Because if we are not focused, then we are robbing principals and teachers of the opportunity to get fewer things done that have higher impact on student achievement. That is where the bulk of the evidence is. Worst of all, I might add parenthetically, that the 2000 school research said that the schools that most needed focus were least likely to have it. Only 2% of high poverty schools, 4% of high ESL schools, 5% of high special ed schools had high levels of focus. Why? No malice again. Everybody's trying to help you. Here a grant, there a grant, everywhere a grant, grant, and people cling at these, and then the faculty has the same amount of time to implement it. Finally, it's got to be local. That means that although the accountability framework is the same, the things that we emphasize may be different depending upon local needs. Here is my final challenge, one of intellectual consistency. I know we won't agree on all these things. There will always be things outside of evaluation that we just do because it's the right thing to do. And so here's what I want to challenge our teachers, our colleagues, our board members on. We cannot simultaneously say, I hate external intrusions. I don't like the federal government, the state government, I'm not sure I even like the local school board telling me what to do. I've heard all that, and then I hear things like, but I don't know if they see those common core assessments, I don't know what we're going to really do about formative writing. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What if we just ask, in the absence of mandates and money, what is the right thing to do? I know what you'd say. There are people in this room who would do informative writing because they know the others that that will help their students, particularly their second language students. They'll, they'll do collaboration and communication and service and leadership, not because it's going to show up in a test score, but because it's the right thing to do. So let's stop the notion that everything that's worth doing is necessarily going to wind up in an evaluation system. For example, you want to look at things that never show up in accountability right now, pre-K, music, art, health. These things are important to you. 
How about student performance that's way above the standard, just as student performance below proficiency winds up being invisible? Some of you have got students performing way beyond, and that doesn't get you any extra credit when it comes to a percent proficiency score. But you do it anyway, because challenge, challenge of our highest performing students is important as well. And monitoring of what we do, not just what kids do, the evidence that we collected said that focus, monitoring, efficacy, the three most important things we can do. So, what can we do? I want to get, again, very specific about the details. We can, with Hattie's work, make sure not that every teacher gets a value-added score three years after the fact, not knowing how it was calculated or what they're supposed to do in response to it. But I'll tell you what we could do. We could have every teacher in individual schools knowing their impact using Hattie's very, very simple, here's where I am right now, here's where the kids are supposed to be by the end of the semester, what percentage of kids were there on April 2nd, this coming Monday, what percent of kids were there on June 2nd. That kind of everybody knowing their impact is more immediate, more specific. Moreover, if you've got to put student achievement into this equation, do it same year, same teacher, same kid. Just in this week's education, we get another article on the devastating impact of teacher transiency, just as we opened with leadership transiency being hurtful to student achievement. If you're going to have a believable achievement component, same year, same teacher, same kid. So let's measure what matters. Here's the kind of things, the nuts and bolts that I think could be in an accountability system. Everybody wants to focus on test scores. I get that, and, I, and, I, and I'm not going to fight against that. Remember, I'm just asking for context. In addition to percent proficient, wouldn't it be interesting to know percentage of students making one or more grade levels of progress? Percentage of kids involved in two or more extracurricular activities. Why would I add that? Because there is overwhelming evidence that when we take disengaged, unhappy kids from zero activities to one to two, it's directly associated with better GPA, better behavior, better attendance. And instead, what happens is that we actively create disincentives for those things because they don't count. The ethical issue, remember, is we'll do it whether it counts or not. Percentage of kids leading a club group or activity. I know people who are really focused on this issue of student leadership because that's what we'll get to engagement. Not just the few self-selected leaders, but all of them. And the percentage of kids publicly sharing their talent, music or art or drama. Why would I do that? Is that just fluff? I did a study on predictors of future leadership. And they weren't what you think. I asked them what they were doing in elementary school and middle school. Differentiated a sample of people who were had similar educational backgrounds, but some were in leaders, others were not. The stereotype would be the leader, that they were the president of the student council, the captain of the athletic team. No. Most commonly shared characteristic on stage early. We believe in developing future leadership. We ought to value those music teachers and drama teachers as much as we're valuing math and English language arts. That's not happening now. So, if it doesn't count, ask yourself, what's going to motivate your staff? You've seen the data on teacher stress and anxiety and burnout. And if we go back with a compliance-driven system, those numbers are going to get worse. If we have the opportunity to go back and have newly professionalized conversations to say, I'm not asking you to do this because it counts. I'm not asking you to do this because it's going to be a check in the box. We're doing this at this school because it's the right thing to do. Which leader do you think is going to be more engaging with those teachers and those students? So at this point, I'll ask our host if I have time for questions or if we need to move on to our panel. We do. So please proceed. There are microphones uh, here, or you can holler out and I'll repeat the question if you would prefer. satisfactory. Uh, and I, I'm sitting here believing that what we do in our district is not much different probably from what other people do. Our candidates go through a very rigorous interview process, demonstration lessons, committee interviews, meetings with the principal, they sit in front of the Board of Education before they're hired. So we feel like we have a pretty good um, handle on filtering out people who probably shouldn't be in the field to begin with. 
Um, and my, again, you just alluded to it. My thought was while you were presenting that, uh, principles uh, are a key factor and turnover ratio of principles is a detrimental factor in achievement progress for students. And my thought at that time was the same holds true for teachers in the classroom. Um, my concern is with that statistic, I know uh, it's my belief uh, that probably the minuscule amount of people who are receiving these detrimental uh, evaluations and are let go or fired um, uh, really comes about because many of those cases we're dealing with RIF positions where the people we even let go, we happen to think are pretty good. We don't have a position for them, uh, a lack of enrollment or um, funding requires us to dismiss people who we think have great potential but haven't had the opportunity. I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, you're, thank you for letting me clarify that. Now, what you just described certainly is the prevailing situation. What, what I was challenging, what this study was all about, was this experiment in Chicago alone, I'm not generalizing to New Jersey, where the, where the assumption was, was that low value added scores would be how you fire people. And, and a lot of the economic studies that you've read talk about the great impact that will have if we just cull the dregs from the bottom and keep the people at the top. But that is assuming that it's low value added scores which are actually going to lead to firing. That is not what happened. Indeed, as, as you just pointed out, sometimes we, we wind up due to issues having nothing to do whatever with, with performance letting people go. Um, so I'm, I'm, they really are two remarkably different situations. I would say that, that we've got some work to do when it comes to teacher assignment. Because you can have somebody who's great in lesson planning and interviews and demonstration lessons, and then we send them consistently to some of our most challenging schools where they're not totally prepared for that. So I, uh, um, I don't know. I, I, I'm just challenging the overuse of value-added information as, as a way to terminate people, because that experiment shows that it didn't happen. This is the point when President Nixon once said, well, I'll ask myself a question. <laughs> <laughs> I have, my name is Rich Sternberg. I'm a middle school principal. I have been a principal for 26 years, both in Virginia and New Jersey. Uh, I have not a question, I have a statement, and I would welcome your suggestion after, observation after. I really believe, I'll use examples, uh, Bethesda, Maryland, Potomac, Maryland are high, highly affluent, socioeconomically at the top. Uh, Washington, D.C., I would say is about 180 degrees away in the public education sector. I, I prognosticate that if you took the two best teachers in Washington, D.C., where the scores are proverbially as low as you can get, and put them in Potomac, Maryland, or Bethesda, Maryland, and the reverse sending Potomac, Maryland teachers, Bethesda, Maryland teachers, to Washington, D.C., you would provide evidence that good teachers are not located in places that don't have high socioeconomic areas uh, very affluent areas based on the evaluation system we have now. So the, my reaction is, is a fairly nuanced one. And let me just start by saying thanks for putting it on the table because it is something that we need to take into account. Pennsylvania just produced a study that the combination of poverty and transiency overwhelmed other factors in student achievement, challenging whether, that's suggesting, and this was a large 100,000 student study, that that needs to be a consideration. That said, let me, let me describe the destructive debate and how I think the association can take the more nuanced middle ground. The destructive debate is, on the one hand, people who I have seen speak to teachers conventions in the West Coast saying, don't even try to close the equity gap until we solve social injustice, housing and health care, parental attention, all these things. All you're doing is teacher blaming when you say that, that we can make improvements in high poverty schools. And you'll get a round of applause for that, which, what a, what a dreary thing to be in a profession where you're feeling completely intimate. But the equally destructive extreme are these guys who go around saying, no excuses. You know, if I can show you one high poverty school that does well in Washington, D.C. or Baltimore or anywhere else, then no excuses. 
Uh, everybody else can do it too. That shows poverty doesn't matter. And anybody who's worked in a high poverty school knows that's ridiculous. The nuanced middle ground, and I would come back to the research of John Hattie on this, is to simultaneously look at multiple variables. For example, does the socioeconomic status of a student impact learning? Of course it does. It's an effect size of 0.49, which in round terms is a year of learning. If you do not intervene decisively for those students, who in kindergarten have one-fifth the vocabulary of their affluent counterparts. They don't have people reading to them at night. They don't have parents who use Microsoft Project Manager to get the fourth grade state history project done. I get all that. There's, there's a difference. But at the same time, Hattie would say, that doesn't let us take a hike until the miracle of social justice happens. What we have to do is to say, what precisely can we do during the school day? And I do believe that, that we can and must hold ourselves and our teachers accountable for what we can control. Um, and there are things that we can control, including things like, like rational homework and grading policies, opportunities for what Hattie calls deliberate practice in school, not just having everything at home. I, in a high poverty school where I worked, my principal, Mr. Robinson, told me that the word homework may or may not have anything to do with the word home. You get the work done, you get the practice done, but stop assuming it's going to happen when three families newly arrived in the United States are all haven't unpacked boxes yet. Um, I think that it is absurd to give somebody a 90-minute literacy block that's designed to keep you on grade level if I've got kids that are three grades behind grade level. So a one-size-fits-all schedule in curriculum is as crazy as one-size-fits-all all leadership. So the nuanced middle ground, sorry, I, I think if I'm understanding you correctly, this, this is a precisely why you don't want to try to develop the perfect framework for teaching and leadership. But you want to give principals the ability to differentiate what they observe and what they emphasize from based upon the unique characteristics of the students. And then hold ourselves accountable by reporting, did it work? And they, by virtue of that level of focus, did we then have some improvement that we can measure? Not over three years, but within the same year. That's, that would be accountability as a learning system that, that would respect precisely the issues that could be raised. Yes, sir. So has anybody looked at you know, just the opposite of what you're talking about the teachers and just closing a failing inner city school and spreading the kids around to some of the suburban schools, which you know, most of the populations aren't growing, many of them now, the ladder is going down. So we can take the 19,000 a year, take 20, 30, 40 kids, take 20 districts around, and check the data on what that would be. Yes, in, in uh, Boston we call it METCO, and let me give you the good and the bad side. You know, it's, it's, it's every social reformer's dream. Take the kids from the inner city, um, and assuming that they're willing to get on a, a commuter rail at 5.30 in the morning, and which, by the way, systematically excludes a lot of those kids from extracurricular activities and so on, but that's a different story. Bring them into the hallowed halls of one of our North Shore suburban schools. We do it. We do it all the time. And you want to know what happens as soon as they cross the threshold of that school? We resegregate them. Because we are so tracked that we have the illusion of creating suburban opportunities, and it's not what is happening. In one district that will re remain nameless, protect the guilty, there's over 500 high school students in, um, in advanced placement classes. Despite this influx of students that's been going on now for many, many years, with plenty of opportunities for remediation and equity, one of those students is African American. Now, you know, we like to think that we're all so enlightened and so liberal in Massachusetts. I just want to suggest we've got a ways to go. Because that, that particular exchange has not worked for us, in my judgment. Now, to be fair, if you were the parent of one of those kids, you'd probably maybe be saying, well, hey, if it's a safer school, and I'd rather have them at least be um, in, in a level four track there than having low expectations. And I, I've heard all, all those excuses, but, but we have no cause for smug satisfaction based on how we're doing it right now. And I would also just add to that, the same applies for, uh, for, for charter schools as well. You know, blow up the public schools and let the charter take it over. Look, I'm, I am actually willing to be open-minded about that, but I wish, I wish we would just look at evidence instead of all this faith-based policy making. And, and, I'll, and I'll tell you who I'm going to quote on this, who I think is particular authority, Chester Finn. Some of you remember him as Assistant Secretary of Education for President Reagan one of the most conservative, leading charter advocates in the country, was in a forum sitting next to me, and here's what Chester Finn said. 
Some of the best schools in the country are charter schools. Some of the worst schools in the country are charter schools. If we don't have accountability, then we're never going to demonstrate that it's not the label, it's teaching and leadership that makes it work. Now, Chester Spin is going to say that. I think that that's something in which we can find some common ground. Yes, ma'am. You discussed the last evaluation being uh, the one that should be used to judge the Yeah, I, want to, I want to repeat this so that everybody can hear. I said that the last evaluation is what ought to be used. How do you reconcile that with the necessity of, of tenure? Because I think what we ought to be evaluating is not, is not the average of different evaluations, but rather response to feedback. Now, there's two ways of doing that. One is to, they can all be using the same instrument, but some are explicitly not evaluative observations. Some are... And it really looks like this. I mean, I, I would tell my colleagues, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going through the telephone book today. Today I'm going to be looking at two things, feedback and multi-method assessment. And I've only got about 20 minutes. So I want you to know what I'm looking for. And I also want you to know that the purpose of this is to set you up for success. So next passing period, next recess, next lunch, I'm going to give you my notes. I'm not keeping any copies of them because this, the purpose of this visit is to improve performance so we can both level with each other. Now, I wish we had more conversations like that and less that are so adversarial because we know that it's this, this dance about what's going to go in, in the book. The problem is, is some of, these, some of these observations are so voluminous, you don't have time for that kind of a nuanced conversation. So my encouragement to you is carve them up into smaller, smaller mini observations and also advocate for the discretion to emphasize different things for different teachers based upon your professional knowledge and observation. Yes? Hi, uh, thank you very inspiring. I've seen you a few times and always have left good thoughts in my head. And one thought that's in my head now is, are there any um, studies that have been done? New Jersey over the last five to 10 years has greatly reduced the number of administrators in each building, each district. And I've been a principal, middle school principal for 10 years, and I've noticed the difference in my ability to have these dialogues, and more not dialogues on an annual basis, those of course take place, or even monthly, but it's almost that daily or weekly dialogue about instruction that's been lost. And I've also lost all my content area supervisors. And I'm in a high achieving district, and by numbers, we, we do well. But I fear, um, feel and fear that uh, you start to lose your control of, of a culture and all the school as a family and where people trust one another. Because if there's less of me and are less of me now, it really does get down into that, okay, you're doing well, you're not doing well, you need to meet a certain statistic. And we have a panel that's coming up and we seem to be moving more into um, a, a time and an era where they really want people like me just to look at a statistic. Um, and I'm curious if there are any studies that have been done as far as you know, supervisory, uh, people compared to numbers of teachers, staff members, students, so on and so forth. Yes, it's a great question. I'll give you a straight answer. There are voluminous studies. The most recent that I think really does is on point to what you're asking is one by Ken Leith with L-E-I-T-H-W-O-D. -E it's a free download at wallacefoundation.org. And you'll see, just there are many other authors, and I'm embarrassed I can't remember their names, but just look under Leithwood, the, the lead author. He specifically looked at a large number of schools in nine states and documented that faculty develop precisely the kind of relationship issues that you're talking about. Of all the things that the principal did, had the greatest positive impact on achievement, and yet they did direct observations of principals who believed that that's what they were doing, but the honest observation is that they were diverted from that by responding to other administrative requirements. Now, so, so the evidence is pretty clear. For goodness sake, friends, it was, what, 30 years ago, John Goodland, 2,500 schools, and he'd have same school, same budget, same union contract, and a leader made the difference. Brian McNulty, um, my colleague, Tim Waters, Bob Marzano, school leadership that works, a meta-analysis. Again, very clear, but one of the top three things in that one was monitoring, which you can only do when you're with teachers. Directly the same finding of my study of more than 2,000 schools published by Columbia. So there's not a shortage of research. The issue is, are we willing to take the research and let it guide our policy and practice? 
where are we going to buy the line? You know, they're just administration. You know, just, you know, any, anybody who's not, that's just administration. Shoot a cannon for those administrators' office. You won't hurt anybody that matters. It's just administration. And I, I don't know where that antipathy comes from, and I'm not really interested in, in debating it. The facts are the facts.